from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of AWS Public Sector Online. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's virtual coverage of AWS Public Sector Summit Online. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Normally we're in person out on Asia Pacific and all the different events for AWS Public Sector, but this year we have to do it remote and we're going to do the remote virtual CUBE with the AWS Virtual Public Sector Online Summit. And we have two great guests here to talk about Digital Earth Africa Project, Clive Charlton, Head of Solutions Architecture, Sub-Saharan Africa with AWS. Clive, thanks for coming on. And Aditya Agarwal, founder of D4D Insights and also an advisor to the Digital Earth Africa Project with AWS. So gentlemen, thank you for coming on. Appreciate you coming on remotely. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us, John. So Clive, take us through real quickly, just take a minute to describe what is the Digital Earth Africa Project what are the problems that you're aiming to solve? Uh, well, we're really um, uh, aiming to provide uh, actionable data to governments and organizations around Africa by providing satellite imagery in an easy to use uh, format um, and doing that on the cloud uh, that, that serves countries uh, throughout, throughout Africa. And just from a cloud perspective, give us a quick taste of what's going on just with the tech. It's on Amazon, you got a little satellite action. Is there a ground station involved? Give us a little bit more color around, you know, what's the scope of the project? Yep, so uh, historic, historically speaking, um, uh, you'd have to process satellite imagery, uh, down, down link it, um, and then uh, do some heavy, heavy lifting around the, the processing of the data. Digital Earth Africa was built uh, from the experiences from, uh, from Digital Earth Australia, originally developed by Geosciences Australia. And they use container services for Kubernetes called Elastic Kubernetes Service to spin up virtual machines, which are required to process the raw, raw satellite imagery into a format called uh, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. Uh, this format is used to store very large volumes of data in a format that's really easy to query. So, uh, organizations can just use uh, an HTTP get range request uh, just to query a part of the file that they're interested in, which means the results are served much, much quicker for a, for a much, much better overall experience. Under the hood, uh, the, store, the data is stored in uh, the Amazon Simple Storage Service, which is S3, and a metadata index in a relational database service uh, that runs the Open Data Cube library, um, which is, allows Digital Earth Africa to store this data in both uh, space and time. It's interesting. I just did uh, some interviews last week on a symposium on space and cybersecurity, and we were talking about the impact of satellites and GPS and just the overall infrastructure shift. And it's just uh, another part of the edge of the network. Uh, DJ, I want to get your thoughts on this and your reaction to the Digital Earth Project. You're an advisor. Um, Let's zoom out. What's the impact of people's lives? Give us a quick overview of how you see it playing out because explain to someone who doesn't know anything about the project. Like, okay, what, what's it about and how does it actually impact people? Sure. Um, so, you know, as, as Clive, Clive mentioned, I mean, there's, there's definitely a, uh, a digital infrastructure behind Digital Earth Africa in a way that it's going to be able to serve free and open satellite data. And often the, the issue around satellite data, especially within the context of Africa and other parts of the world, is that there's a, a level of capacity that's required in order to be able to use that data. Um, but there's also all kinds of access issues because traditionally uh, satellite data is heavy. Uh, there's the, the old model of being able to download the data and then being able to do something with it. And then often about 80% of the time that you spend on satellite data is spent just pre-processing the data before you can actually do any of the fun analysis around it. That really sort of impacts the kinds of decisions and actions that you're looking for. And so that's why Digital Earth Africa, and, and that's why this partnership with Amazon is a fantastic partnership because it really allows us to be able to scale the approach across the entire continent, make it easy for that data to be accessed and make it easier for people to be able to use that data. The way that Digital Earth Africa is being operationalized is that we're not just looking at it from the perspective of, let's put another infrastructure into Africa. We want this program, and it's, it is a program that we want institutionalized within Africa itself. One that 
leverages expertise across the continent and one that brings in uh, organizations across the continent to really sort of take the leadership and ownership of this program as it moves forward. The idea of it is that once you're able to have this information, um, being able to address issues like food security, um, uh, climate change, coastal resilience, land degradation, where illegal mining is, where is the water, uh, we want to be able to do that in a way that it's really looking at what are the national development priorities within the countries themselves, and how does it also then support regional and global frameworks like uh, Africa's Agenda 2063 and the Sustainable Development Goals. No doubt in my mind, Ashley, is the huge benefits to these kinds of technologies. Uh, I want to also just ask you as a follow-up, there's a huge space race going on right now, explosion of availability of satellite data. And again, more satellites are going up, there's more congestion, more contention. Again, we had a big event on that cybersecurity and the congestion issue, but you know, satellite data was powering everyone here in, in the United States. You want an Uber, you want Google Maps, you got, you're everywhere with your with GPS. Without it, we'd be kind of like wondering what's going on. How do we even vote these days? So certainly an impact, but there's a huge surge of availability of the use of satellite data. How do you explain this? And what are the, some of the challenges um, from the data side that's coming from the Digital Earth Africa project that you guys hope to resolve? Sure. Um, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I think at one level, when you're looking at the space race right now, satellites are becoming cheaper. They're becoming more efficient. There's increased technology now on the types of sensors that you can deploy. There's companies like Planet that are really revolutionizing how um, even small countries are able to deploy their own satellites and the constellation that they're putting forward in terms of the, the frequency by which you're able to get data for any given part of the earth on a daily basis. Coupled with that, and you know, uh, this is really sort of in, in, in Clive's purview, but the, the cloud computing capabilities and overall computing power that you have today than what you had 10 years, 15 years ago is so vastly different. What used to take weeks to do before um, for any kind of analysis on satellite data, which is heavy data, now takes you know, minutes or hours to do. So when you put all that together, um, again, you know, I think it really speaks to the power of this partnership with Amazon and really what that means for how this data is going to be delivered to Africa, because it really allows for the scalability for anything that happens through Digital Earth Africa. And so, for example, one of the, the approaches that we're taking as we identify what the priorities and needs are at the country level, let's say that it's uh, land degradation, there's often common issues across countries. And so when we can take one particular issue, test it with additional countries, and then we can scale it across the whole continent because the infrastructure is there for the whole continent. Yeah, that's a great point. And so many storylines here, we'll get to Clive in a second on sustainability. And I want to talk about the open data platform, obviously open data. Having data is one thing, but now trained data and having more trusted data becomes a huge issue. Again, I want to dig into that for a second, but Clive, I want to ask you first, uh, what region are we in? I mean, is this, you guys actually have a great, first of all, we've been covering the region expansion from Bahrain all the way through as, as it moves around the world, probably soon in space, there'll be a region, um, Amazon space station region, probably someday in the future. Um, but what region are you running the project out of? Can you, and why is it important? Can you share the update on the regional piece? Well, we're very pleased that uh, Digital Earth Africa is using the new Africa region in Cape Town in South Africa, which was launched in uh, April of this year. It's one of 24 regions around the world, and we have another three new regions announced. What this means for users of Digital Earth Africa is that they're able to use the region closest to them, which gives them the best user experience. It's the, it's the quickest connection for them. But more importantly, we also wanted uh, to use an African solution uh, for African people. And using the Africa region in Cape Town really aligned with that thinking. So localization on the data, latency, all that stuff is kind of within the region, within country here. That's right. Amazon. Yeah. And why is that important? Is there any other benefits? Why should someone care? Obviously, there's failover options having other countries to go to, but why is having something in that region important for this project? Well, it, it comes down to latency for the for the users. Um, so being as close to the data as possible is is really important for the user experience, um, especially when you're looking at uh, at large data sets and, and big queries. Uh, you don't want be you you don't want to be waiting a long lag time for that query to go backwards and forwards between the user and the region. Um, so having the data in uh, the Africa region in Cape Town is important. 
So talk about the region. I love when these new regions roll out from Amazon because obviously it's this huge build up CapEx and this huge data center servers and everything. Um, sustainability is a huge part of the story. Um, how does the sustainability piece fit into the, the data initiative supported in Africa? Can you share some updates on that? Um, well, this, this project is also um, closely aligned with the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative, which looks to accelerate sustainability research and innovation, uh, really by minimizing the cost and the time uh, required to acquire and analyze large sustainability data sets. So uh, the initiative supports innovators and researchers with the data and tools and, and technical experience that they need to move sustainability to the next level. Uh, these are public data sets and publicly available to anyone. Um, in addition to that, uh, the initiative provides cloud grants to those who are interested in exploring the use of AWS technology and scalable infrastructure to serve sustainability challenges of this nature. Aditya, I want to get your thoughts on this a comment that Clive made around latency. Uh, and certainly having a region there has great benefits. No need to harp on that. Everyone knows I'm a big fan of the regional model. Um, but it brings up the issue of what's going on in the country from an infrastructure standpoint. A lot of mobility, a lot of edge computing. I can almost imagine that. So, so how do you see that evolving from a business standpoint, from a project standpoint, um, data standpoint? Can you comment and react to that edge, edge angle? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the the value of an open data infrastructure is that you want to use that infrastructure to create a whole data ecosystem type of an approach. And so from the perspective of being able to make this data readily accessible, uh, make it, making it efficiently accessible, and really being able to bring industry into um, that ecosystem, because of what we really want um, as we, as the program matures is for this program to then also instigate the development of new businesses, entrepreneurship, really get the uh, young people across Africa, which has the, the, the largest proportion of young people anywhere in the world to be engaged around what you can do with satellite data and the types of businesses that can uh, be developed around it. And so by having all of our data reside in Cape Town on the continent, there's obviously technical benefits to that in terms of being able to apply the data and create new businesses. There's also um, a, 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 a perception in, in, in the fact that the data that Digital Earth Africa is serving is in Africa and residing in Africa, which does have, which does go a long way. Yeah, and that's a huge value. And I can just imagine the creativity, Clive, if you can comment on this open data platform idea, because um, some of the commentary that we've been having on the cube here and all around the world is data is great. We all know we're living with a lot of data. You're starting to see that the commoditization and horizontal scalability of data is one thing, but to put it into software defined environments, whether it's an entrepreneur coding up an app or doing something to share some transparency around some initiatives going on within the, the region or in the continent, it's about trusted data. It's about sharing algorithms. AI is also a consumer of data. Machines consume data. So it's not just a technology. Data is part of this new normal. What's this uh, open data platform and how does that translate into value in your opinion? I, yeah, um, and you know, when, when data is shared on, on AWS, anyone can analyze it and build services on top of it using a, you know, a broad range of, of compute and data, data analytics products, you know, things like Amazon EC2 or Lambda, which is our serverless compute, uh, to things like uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce for complex uh, extract and uh, transformation processes. But sharing data in the cloud lets users spend more time on the data analysis rather than, than the data acquisition. And researchers can analyze data shared on AWS without needing to, to pay to store their own copy, which is what the open data platform provides. You only have to pay for the compute that you use and you don't need to purchase storage to start a new project. So the registry of the open data on AWS makes it easy to find those data sets uh, by, by making them publicly available through AWS services. And when you share, share your data on AWS, you, may, you make it available to a large and growing community of, of de developers and startups and enterprises uh, all around the world. And, you know, and we've been talking particularly around, around Africa. Yeah. Um, so it's an open source model, basically. It's free, you don't, it doesn't cost you anything. Probably to start maybe down the road, if it gets heavy, maybe to charging, but for the most part, easy for scientists to use 
and then you're leveraging it into the open, contributing back. Is that right? Yep, that's right. And getting getting researchers and and uh, startups and organizations going quickly without having to worry about the data acquisition, they can just get going and start building. All right. Well, I want to get back to Aditya on the skill gap issue because he brought up something I thought was really cool. People are going to start building apps. You're going to start to see more innovation. What are the needs out there? Because we're seeing a huge onboarding of new talent, young talent, um, people reskilling from existing jobs. Certainly COVID's accelerated uh, people looking for more different kinds of work. I'm sure there's a lot of <laughs> demand to do some innovative things. The question I always get, I want to get your reaction is, what are the skills needed to, to get involved, to one, contribute, but also benefit from it? whether it's the data, satellite data, or just how to get involved skill-wise. Sure, skills. sure. Yeah, so um, most recently we've created a six-week training course um, that's really kind of taken users from understanding the basics of Earth observation data to how to work with Python, to how to create their own Jupyter notebooks and their own use cases. And so there's a, there's a wide sort of range of skill sets that are required depending on who you are. Because effectively, what we want to be able to do is get everyone from kind of the technical user that might have some remote sensing background to the developer, to the policymaker and decision maker to understand the value of this infrastructure. Whether you're the one who's actually analyzing the data, if you're the one who's developing new applications, or you're taking that information from a managerial or policy level discussion to actually deliver the action and sort of impact that you're looking for. And so, um, you know, in, in, in that regard, uh, we're working with ITC in the Netherlands and again with institutions across Africa that already have a mandate and expertise in this particular area to create a holistic capacity development program uh, that will address all of those different factors. So I guess the follow-up question I want to have is how do you ensure the priorities of Africa are addressed as part of this program? Yeah. So. Uh, we are, we've created a governance model that really is both top down and bottom up. At the bottom up level, we have a technical advisory committee that has over 15 institutions, many of which are based across Africa, that really have a good understanding of the needs, the priorities, and the mandate for how to work with countries. And at the, the top down level, we're developing a governing board uh, that will be inclusive of the key uh, continental level institutions that really uh, provide the political buy-in, the sustainability of the program, um, and really provide overall guidance. And within that, we're also creating an operational model such that these institutions that do have the capacity to support the program, they're actually the ones who are also going to be supporting the implementation of the program itself. And there's been some um, United Nations sustained development projects, all kinds of um, government involvement around making sure certain things would happen within the country. Can you just share some of the highlights of some of the key initiatives that are going on that you're supporting um, to make it a better better world? Yeah, so this is this program is very closely aligned to uh, sustainable development agenda. And so looking after the looking developing methods that really address the sustainable development goals is one facet. Uh, in Africa, they, there's another program looking uh, over overall national development priorities and sustainability called Agenda 2063. Um, and really, like I think what it really comes down to, this, this wouldn't be happening uh, without the country level involvement themselves. So this started with five countries originally, Senegal, Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania. Um, and uh, the government of Kenya real, itself has really been a kind of a founding partner for how Digital Earth Africa and its predecessor, the Africa Regional Data Cube, came to be. And so without high level support and political buy-in within those governments, um, I mean, it's really because of that, um, uh, th that's why we're, we're where we are. Aditya, thank you for coming on and sharing that insight. Clive, we'll give you the final word. For the folks watching um, Digital Earth Africa, processes petabytes of data. I mean, the satellite data is well huge. Uh, you mentioned it's a new region. You're running Kubernetes, elastic Kubernetes service, making containers easy to use, pay as you go. So you got cutting edge. Uh, take the one minute to, to share why this region's cutting edge. Um, does it have the scale of other regions? What should they know about AWS in Cape Town for Africa's new region? Take a minute to, to put a plug in. 
Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that, John. Um, so our, our regions are, are, are built uh, in, in, the same, in the same way all around the world. Um, so uh, they're built for redundancy and reliability. Uh, they typically have uh, a minimum of uh, three what we call availability zones. And each one is, uh, contains a, uh, a cluster of, of data centers. Um, and all interconnected with uh, fast fiber. So, um, you know, the, you can survive, uh, you know, a, a failure with uh, with no impact to to your services. And the Cape Town region is built in exactly the same the same way. Uh, we have most of the services available in the in the Cape Town region, uh, like most other regions. So, uh, as a user of AWS, um, you you can have the confidence that. Uh, you can deploy your your services and workloads into AWS and run it in the same uh, in the same way with the same kind of speed and the same kind of support and infrastructure that's that's backing uh, any any region anywhere else in the world. Well, great. Thanks for that that plug, uh, Deetia. Thank you for your insight. And again, innovation follows cloud computing. Whether you're building on top of it as a startup, a government or enterprise, or to make society better. In this case. The Digital Earth Africa project. Great, uh, great story. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you for I'm having John. us, John. I'm John Furrier with the Cube Virtual Remote, not in person this year. I uh, hope to see you next time in person. Thanks for watching.